echocardiography is ultrasound imaging of the heart ultrasound is sound wave which cannot be heard by the human ear normal human ear can hear sounds from the range of 20 hertz to 20000 hertz 20000 hertz will be uh, 20 kilohertz so this is the audible frequency normal audible frequency of human ear something below that will be called as infrasound and something above that is about 20 kilohertz will be called as ultrasound these inaudible sound waves can be used like uh, beams the ultrasound probe which you have that is the echo probe or the regular ultrasound probe when kept on the chest will send beam of ultrasound into the body normally for echocardiography there are certain windows echocardiographic windows where the heart is not covered by the lungs lungs will uh, reflect off ultrasound so that uh, you will not be able to get a good image everything will be white on echocardiogram when you place the ultrasound probe over the lungs so you have a few places where the probe can be placed one is a suprasternal notch where you can image the upper part of the heart and arctic arch but more commonly you place it on the chest on the left side of the chest that is just over the heart in the parasternal left parasternal region is the most commonly used or the first view usually obtained is left parasternal view here you can see real time two dimensional images in parasternal long axis view you can see the right ventricle anteriorly interventricular septum left ventricle aorta left atrium and a portion of descending aorta you can image the heart along its long axis from the base to apex or perpendicular to it uh, imaging along the long axis will be called as parasternal long axis view if you are imaging perpendicular to it then it is called parasternal short axis view these are the first two views usually obtained after that you can obtain a view from the apex you keep the probe just at the apex and direct the echo beam upwards that is apical view usually first you look at the apical four chamber view and after the apical four chamber view we'll tilt the transducer a bit so that only two chambers are seen that is apical two chamber view then you could also tilt in such a way that iota is also seen along with the apical view that is apical four chamber view along with iota will be called as apical five chamber view so these are the usual views obtained from the apex then uh, you have the suprasternal view in the suprasternal notch so that uh, you can image the aortic arch portion of the descending aorta ascending aorta and also if there is a ductus patent ductus arteriosus coarctation all these can be imaged from the suprasternal notch then occasionally you may need a right parasternal view also when you think that the right atrium is enlarged you want to assess the TR sometimes you use a right parasternal view then still other occasions uh, you may use a axillary view that is to image the inferior vena cava usual imaging of inferior vena cava is done from the subcostal view from the subcostal region you try, uh, direct the beam upwards so that you see the lower part of the heart including the inferior vena cava that is the usual method of viewing the inferior vena cava but when the chest is opened with surgery uh, after either thoracic surgery or upper abdominal surgery and there is a dressing you cannot image the inferior vena cava from the subcostal view then you go for the uh, uh, axillary view you direct the beam towards the inferior vena cava from the axilla now we have different modes of echocardiography the very old mode was the M mode or TM mode time motion mode in which it is almost like a graph with the horizontal axis being time 
and vertical axis distance from the location of the probe. Suppose the probe is placed on the anterior chest wall. If you are imaging structures beneath that, the nearest structure that is the anterior wall of the right ventricle will be seen at the topmost region of the image and the posterior structures like left atrium will be seen at the bottom of the image. That is the M mode echocardiography, time motion mode. And there were B mode uh, and uh, other modes, amplitude modes also earlier, which are not being used at all now. Even time mo motion mode, that is the M mode, uh, is being used only for measurements, left ventricular measurements, typically for assessment of left ventricular ejection fraction, as it is a simple method. Otherwise, uh, M mode is very rarely used nowadays. That was used in olden days when the initial transducers had only facility for M mode. There was no facility for the currently what we are using is a two dimensional. You have a sector scan that is two dimensional sector scan as if you are imaging uh, from one side of the heart to the other. The beam is swung electronically swung from one side to another so that you have a two dimensional mode. In echocardiography, the ultrasound uh, signals are sent out and the echoes are received. Typically, it might send for one microsecond and listen for 999 microseconds. And then the next pulse is sent out. So, uh, when you receive the echoes, the time elapsed between the signal sent and when the actual echo is received, you can find out uh, the distance from the surface or the location of the probe. That is how the images are obtained and it is computer synthesized so that you have a two dimensional image. Now there is a still more advanced, advanced mode that is three dimensional. In three dimensional the probe as a solid probe which sends out multiple signals so that when you combine the received signals you can have a 3D reconstruction which can also be live 3D reconstruction. In the initial era of 3D echocardiography several years back, it was only offline reconstruction. But now uh, the 3D probes can give live echocardiography, 3D echocardiography images, which is known as 4D echocardiography. Live 3D is known as 4D echocardiography. There is another mode in echocardiography known as Doppler echocardiography. Doppler echocardiography measures the Doppler shift. You might have noticed that when you are sitting in a railway station waiting for a train, when the train is approaching you, the whistling sound of the train has a different frequency. And when it comes near you, the frequency changes a little more. And when it is moving away from you, the frequency is changing still more. This is known as Doppler shift. And when the Doppler shift or change in frequency can be detected, you can find out the velocity of the train. Similarly, uh, ultrasound beam is focused on the red blood cells in uh, the heart and the blood vessels so that when the reflected signals are received, the change in frequency, suppose you are sending out 2 megahertz and there is a slight change in the received frequency, uh, whether it is increasing or decreasing, you know whether the blood cells are moving towards the transducer or away from the transducer. In Doppler, there is conventional old time Doppler was that it was depicted as a graph above and below the baseline. That is simple Doppler. And now we have color Doppler in which uh, the uh, information is overlaid on a two dimensional image. So you can know in which direction blood is flowing through different structures. Suppose there is a wall which is narrowed, there will be a high velocity jet across that wall. Example in mitral stenosis, uh, when the left atrial blood flows into the left ventricle in diastole, it will be high velocity turbulent flow. Similarly in aortic stenosis, when left ventricular blood is ejected out into the aorta, it will be a turbulent flow. And when there is aortic regurgitation, then also you have a turbulent flow from the aorta to the left ventricle and that's an abnormal flow. And by convention, color coding is such a way that 
when the flow is away from the transducer, which is kept on the surface, it is color coded blue. When it is flowing towards the transducer, it will be color coded red. And in high velocity flows, there will be something known as variance. Different regions will have different velocities due to turbulence. Then a variance is coded so that you have a mixing of colors. That is known as mosaic pattern. Mosaic pattern is typically seen in all the high velocity jets like uh, aortic regurgitation, aortic stenosis. Everywhere you have the mosaic pattern. That's how you easily recognize a jet. Suppose there is a small ventricular septal defect which may not be visible on the two dimensional echo but as the opening is very small the jet from the left ventricle into the right ventricle will have a high velocity. So it's easy to detect a small VSD by Doppler than by two dimensional echocardiography. This is left ventricle to right atrial shunt shown on color Doppler. You can see the shunt from the left ventricle across a perimembranous VSD into the right atrium. It's a rare form of perimembranous VST with LVRA shunt. Till more advanced modes like speckle tracking, strain imaging, strain rate imaging, all those things I will not be discussing now. In Doppler echocardiography, there are three different modes. One is pulsed wave Doppler. Different pulses are given out and the echoes are received. The advantage is that you can exactly find out the place where the abnormal velocity is located in the heart because you are sending out a pulse and receiving it and you can calculate the time interval in between. But if you use a continuous wave, you are continuously sending out and continuously receiving, then you won't be able to know exactly from which location the echo has come or the Doppler shift has come. That is continuous wave. Uh, but why you are using continuous wave? In pulsed Doppler, there is a limitation. Only lower velocity flows, typically the normal flows across the walls can be calculated by pulsed Doppler. If you have a higher velocity like a regurgitant jet or a stenotic jet, that cannot be calculated using a pulsed Doppler. You need continuous wave. So in continuous wave, you can calculate the velocity of a high velocity jet and uh, from the velocity, you can calculate the gradient also. Gradient is calculated using a formula known as Bernoulli equation 4v squared. That is square of the velocity into 4 will give you the gradient. So you can know the gradient between the left ventricle and iota in aortic stenosis or gradient between left atrium and left ventricle in mitral stenosis and so on. So there are various ways of calculating the gradients. And there is another intermediate mode in between that is known as high pulse repetition mode that is HPRF. In that multiple pulses are sent. It is not a continuous wave or a single pulses. As multiple pulses are sent, the resolution range that is higher velocities can be calculated using HPRF mode oh, and the disadvantage is that depth perception is slightly lost also but most of the time we use HPRF to detect high velocity jets and calculate the gradient and sometimes continuous wave also. In pulse Doppler you use it only for finding out the location uh, where the exact location where the abnormal flow is, is there and also uh, for normal flows. But with the onset of color Doppler, you actually don't need these things. You need only, you have to put the color Doppler, find out where the jet is located and then uh, you will use either continuous wave or uh, HPRF. You will not use uh, pulse, simple pulse Doppler. In pulse Doppler, there is something known as aliasing. Aliasing is that, uh, suppose uh, the flow is in one direction, the depiction on the echocardiograph will be in opposite direction if it is beyond the aliasing limit 
or the Nyquist limit. That limit is known as Nyquist limit which is beyond which the signal gets aliased. An upward signal will be depicted as downward. That is known as aliasing. Nyquist limit is half the pulse repetition frequency. That is why usual pulse Doppler has a low Nyquist limit while high pulse repetition frequency uh, Doppler HPRF has a higher Nyquist limit. Continuous wave Doppler typically has an infinite Nyquist limit. Uh, it will not be aliased at all. But in echocardiographs, you can change the setting in such a way that when you shift the baseline upwards or downwards or when you increase or decrease the velocity ranges, aliasing can be there even for all these modes that you have to take care of in the settings when you are imaging a particular velocity. Uh, once you get aliasing, you change the either you change the baseline or you change the velocity limit in such a way that you get a non-aliased signal on the screen before identifying the direction of the signal as well as the uh, maximum velocity. Another important aspect in this uh, is that in any measurement it is always nice to have ECG along with echocardiography. When you connect the ECG leads it's easy to time between systole and diastole. You know that Systole starts from the peak of the R wave and ends towards the end of T wave. That is the usual period of systole. Otherwise, sometimes what you think as a diastolic jet may be a systolic one and the other way around. So, for any good measurement, you have to have timing with ECG. Every echocardiograph has ECG leads and you can attach the ECG leads and time it. Uh, sometimes in a busy echocardiography laboratory you may not do it especially when you are uh, confident that this particular case will not have such difficulty but especially in younger children when the heart rate is faster you may need ECG timing to exactly delineate systole and diastole. So far we have been discussing about transthoracic echocardiography with a probe kept on the chest wall. Then there is something not, known as Transesophageal echocardiography. In transesophageal echocardiography, a probe is introduced into the esophagus. Probe is at the tip of an uh, esophagoscope like thing and it is introduced into the esophagus. You can image the heart from behind. The advantage is that lung does not overlap the heart in transesophageal echocardiography. Secondly, it is easier to image structures which are posterior and another advantage is that as the heart is nearer to the probe in transesophageal echocardiography you can use higher frequency transducers. You know that higher frequency transducers have higher resolution but penetration will be lower. Suppose you use on the chest it will not reach up to the posterior part of the heart. Uh, usual adult echocardiography the probe may be about 2.25 megahertz pediatric you can have uh, 5 megahertz a neonatal you may have 7.5 megahertz or 10 megahertz. So an intraesophageal or transesophageal probe can have higher frequency for that particular individual and you have a better high resolution imaging. For example, left atrial appendage clot evaluation, transesophageal echocardiography as an advantage. Then left atrial evaluation behind a prosthetic wall. When you image from above, uh, the left atrial part of the prosthetic wall may not be imaged well uh, because of acoustic shadowing by the metallic components. There are some such advantages for transesophageal echocardiography. Another advantage is that you can have the transesophageal probe during surgery so that you can monitor the uh, heart during cardiac surgery as well as non-cardiac surgery. For monitoring of left ventricular function during non-cardiac surgery, transesophageal echocardiography is an important 
method and nowadays most uh, advanced anesthesiologists use uh, you know, transesophageal echocardiography even for non-cardiac surgery to monitor the function of the heart just as you have ECG and other parameter monitors during anesthesia. So several advantages are there for transesophageal echocardiography. Only disadvantage is that it is semi-invasive and operator has a higher learning curve. You have to have some experience like an endoscopist and uh, a patient may gag uh, or rather retch when it is done under conscious situation. In intraoperative, that's, that disadvantage is not there. Uh, there are some regions which may not be imaged well by transesophageal probe. Uh, that is uh, when the trachea comes, air column comes between the probe and the image structure, some part of the aortic arch, it may not be imaged well. Otherwise, posterior structures are better imaged. Another advanced mode of echocardiography is intracardiac echocardiography or ICE. A catheter with ultrasound probe at the tip is introduced through the venous system into the right atrium and uh, the heart is imaged from within. It is standard procedure nowadays for uh, electrophysiology procedures, left atrial ablation procedure and several other things. Uh, you can image structures with much better clarity by intracardiac echocardiography. Of course, it is going to be more costly uh, as the probe is likely to be much costlier and uh, you may have to use it less frequently also. So intracardiac echocardiography is another advancement. A similar advancement is intracoronary ultrasound. Catheters the size of a coronary catheter can be introduced into the coronary artery to image the structures of the coronary plaque and coronary arterial wall, stents, dissection, all from within the coronary lumen. That is known as intravascular ultrasound, intracoronary ultrasound. A similar one is a Doppler wire. You can introduce a wire with a Doppler transducer on it into the coronary artery and it can detect uh, uh, velocities or rather gradients across stenosis. That is known as uh, Doppler, intracoronary Doppler. It is used for estimation of uh, uh, fractional flow reserve. Those are all advanced forms of or rather invasive forms of echocardiography.